Our text this morning is taken from Matthew's Gospel, and we're just going to read verses 13 through 18. This is talking about the Magi, and Matthew tells us that when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, said, get up and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child in order to kill him. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity that were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious Father, we just ask you to be with us now. Still our hearts, let us focus on your word and we just ask that your Holy Spirit who will speak to each one that is here this morning. And so we give you this, we give you thanks for this time together. And we ask for your blessing. Amen. You know, as a preacher, and I've been preaching here for many years now, and uh, when, for, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when it comes to Christmas time, you know, trying to say something new and that, uh, that uh, you know, will help you to uh, focus on what Christmas is all about is, is a real challenge, especially since there's four weeks in Advent. And uh, so today it's a little bit different approach and uh, the title of the sermon is Weeping at Christmas Time. How many of you know the name Michael Card? Okay, who's Michael Card, Ken? He's a singer. He's a singer, okay. He's a uh, Christian singer and songwriter and uh, he's best known for his contemporary uh, Christian music. And uh, with relatively simple devotional songs, Card recaptures the simple truths of the nativity. A homeless king born in a barn, wrapped in rags, asleep in a feeding trough for the farm animals, and the smell of urine soaked hay all around. And one of his songs about the nativity, he writes, he says, we've created a pretty significant myth. Over the course of 2,000 years, we've turned the barn into a palace and the Bible story of Jesus' birth into something like a fairy tale. Michael Card, of course, in some ways is right on target. That first Christmas wasn't as pretty and it wasn't as clean as, as we have made it out to be. In our text this morning, Matthew talks about a very sinister man who was out to kill Christmas. It's a bizarre kind of story that doesn't seem like it should even be in our Bibles. It's a story that doesn't sound right in the midst of our Christmas cards and our Christmas carols especially the one we just sang, Joy to the World and O Holy Night. It's a story that just doesn't look right in the middle of all the sparkling lights and candy canes and merrymaking at this time of the year. And what we have here is a story about Herod's soldiers rounding up what has been determined to be about 20 baby boys and running them through with their swords and their spears. And history has labeled this event the slaughter of the innocents. The reality is that this is a story that we would just as soon ignore or forget. Nevertheless, it's in our Bibles, 
and is part of the Christmas story. Tucked away towards the end of chapter two in Matthew's gospel. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. As our text tells us, he then gave orders to kill all the boys of Bethlehem and his vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This is what Michael Card was talking about, this part of what we call, what he calls the scandal of Christmas. Whenever choirs do Christmas concerts, they don't sing about this part of the Christmas story. And as far as I know, neither do any of our Christmas carols mention this part of the Christmas story. Yet it happened in that little town called Bethlehem. What Herod did to those babies is just as real as Mary giving birth to Jesus. Mary rejoicing, Rachel weeping, angels singing, mothers crying, all wrapped up together. The question that comes to mind is, why is this part of the Christmas story recorded in our Bibles anyways? It must be true because our Bibles record it as a sober historical fact. And it must be important, or why else would Matthew have written about it? Why would he insert it in his gospel? So what this tells us is that there must be something here that we need to think about something that we need to grasp hold of, something about which we need to ask ourselves, what's going on here? As we look at our text this morning, we can't help but be struck with the enormous presence of evil. In fact, it's hard to find the right words to describe it. Barbaric, despicable, hideous, inhuman, unspeakably cruel. It's an act that is akin to what took place this past week in Pakistan when 132 innocent children were massacred by terrorists from the Pakistani Taliban. Now with regards to what happened in Bethlehem, it may help if you realize that Herod was a very sick and a very old man at the time. He had been in power for 40 years. And like all dictators, he held tightly on to the reins of his power and brutally removed anyone that was a threat to that. Over the years, he killed hundreds of people, including his brother-in-law, his mother-in-law, and his second wife, Miriam, a wife that he loved very deeply. According to biblical scholar, scholars, it was the murder of his wife that eventually drove him insane. He killed her because he thought she, he thought she was a, a threat to his power, but he never got over her. Even though he was only 44 years old when he killed her, and even though he lived to be 70, her murder was what helped to drive him crazy. Herod, above everything else, was a killer. Like Isis or Isil, as it's called today, he had absolutely no regard for the sanctity of human life. Killing was in his nature. He killed out of spite and he killed out of fear. Human life meant nothing to him. The great historian Josephus called him barbaric. Perhaps his basic character can be best be seen by one incident in the year 7 BC. Herod is an old man now. He's been in power for 41 years. He knows he doesn't have much longer to live. Word comes to him that his sons are plotting to overthrow him. There are five sons by his latest wife. 
he orders all of them to be put to death by strangulation. It's no wonder that Caesar Augustus said of him, it's safer to be Herod's sow than to be his son. That is why the critics are wrong who question this story about the slaughter of the innocent, saying that Matthew made it up. Quite on the, in the contrary, it, it fits with everything else that we know about Herod. But there's something that we need to consider here, something that God's Holy Spirit wants us to grasp by including this part of the Christmas story in Matthew's Gospel. This barbaric act fits in with everything we know about human nature, about what our Bibles call our sin nature. It's easy to read about a man like, like Herod and, turn to, and to turn him into some kind of a monster. We like to do that because it puts us in a different category from him. But in truth, Herod most of the time was just as normal as we are. History tells us that he was basically a good ruler who could on occasion be amazingly generous and kind. The only difference between Herod and us is that he had the power to carry out his evil intentions without having to worry about consequences. A few years ago, Chuck Colson wrote a column about an event that took place when the Nazi Adolf Eichmann, who helped plan the systematic destruction of millions of Jews in the Holocaust, was put on trial in Israel. A Jewish man by the name of Yehiel Denner had survived the concentration camps and had testified against Eichmann when he was tried in absentia at the Nuremberg trials after World War II. Years later, the Israeli special forces captured Eichmann in a daring raid in Argentina and returned him to Israel to stand trial for his crimes. Diner attended this 1961 trial as a witness. And when he saw Eichmann in the courtroom, he began to sob uncontroll uncontrollably. And then he fainted and he fell to the floor. The question is why? Was it hatred? Was it fear? Was it horrid memories? Speaking in an interview with Mike Wallace on the show 60 Minutes, Diner explained that during the war he had feared Eichmann because he saw him as someone fundamentally different from himself. But now seeing him stripped of all his Nazi glory, Diner saw Eichmann for what he really was, just an ordinary man. I was afraid about myself, Diner said. As I looked at him, I saw that I was capable of doing what he did. I am exactly like him. That is why he collapsed to the floor, Mike Wallace tells us. And then he summarizes up this truth in six terrifying words. He says, Eichmann is in all of us. Now this is the central truth that we find in our Bibles about our fleshly nature. Uh, sin is in all of us. Not just the temptation to sin, not just the propensity to sin, but sin itself. As the Apostle Paul puts it, it is sin living in me that causes me to do the evil that I hate. Or as Jeremiah the prophet puts it, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And we don't like to hear this truth, which is why we don't like to think about stories like the slaughter of the innocents. They force us to confront the truth about ourselves, who we really are. The words of Romans 3, verses 22 and 23, ring in our ears. There is no difference, the Apostle Paul says, for we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no difference between Eichmann and Denner, no difference between Herod and ourselves. 
You may think that you would never do what Herod did, but don't be too sure. Given the right conditions, you and I would do almost anything. Apart from the grace of God, there is no sin that we wouldn't commit. This now brings us to another truth about the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. The slaughter of the innocents remind us once again why Christ had to be born. When the angel told Joseph and Mary told Joseph about Mary's pregnancy, he instructed Joseph to give the baby the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus literally means God saves. When the angel of the Lord told the shepherds not to be afraid, he said it was because he had good news for them. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And so Jesus came to save us from the consequences of our sins. He came to save us from the fires of hell. He came, in other words, as our savior. Now, if you don't have any sin in your life, then you don't need Jesus. That is, you don't need a savior. However, as our Bibles tell us, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so in one sense, the slaughter of the innocents of Bethlehem is a perpetual reminder that this is why Jesus had to be born. This is what Christmas is all about. He came as a savior for the shepherds. He came as a savior for the wise men. He came as a savior for Herod. He came as a savior for those babies in Bethlehem. He came as a savior for the mothers and the fathers. He came as a savior for you and me because in the end, Romans 3, 22 and 23 is true. There is no difference. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners desperately in need of a savior. Do you know what God's providence is? God's providence is that doctrine that teaches us that God is in control of every detail in our lives, of every detail in our universe. And do you know what that, do you know what that means? It means that God's plans will not be thwarted. God's plans will not be stopped. Herod did everything he could to kill the baby Jesus. In the book of Revelation, however, it was really Satan who was using Herod as his pawn. In the 12th chapter, we are told, the dragon that is the, that ancient serpent called the devil stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he could, might devour her child the moment he was born. Herod killed every baby to and under that he could find, but the one baby that he wanted to kill, he couldn't find. That's the providence of God in action. I suppose you could ask, well, if God warned Joseph and Mary about Herod's intentions, why didn't he warn those other parents? And that's a good question. And on one level, I have no answer at all. But remember this, God always has a bigger plan than we can see from where we sit. He protected his son so that one day his son could die on a cross for your sins and my sins and for the sins of the world. Those babies of Bethlehem died so that that first Christmas could take place. The baby Jesus would grow up and he would die later. Jesus had to escape this time so that he would not escape the next time. You might say it this way, Jesus escaped the first time so that he wouldn't escape the second time so that you and I would escape for all time. Very early in church history, these babies of Bethlehem came to be regarded as the first Christian martyrs. In a sense, they symbolize the ongoing battle between God and Satan for control of the earth. When Adam and Eve sinned, Satan struck a blow for evil. And from that time on until this very hour, sin has reigned in the corner, every corner of this planet. 
and has found a home in every human heart. All the pain and all the suffering we see around us may be traced back to that fateful moment in the Garden of Eden. Since then, the armies of evil have been on the march in every generation. They have landed wave after wave of soldiers on beachheads around the world. There are times when it seems as if the battle is over and even evil will reign unmolested forever. But if Christmas means anything, it is this. God always wins in the end. At Bethlehem, God launched a mighty counteroffensive that continues to this day. And it all started with a tiny baby by the name of Jesus, born in a scandalous way in a barn to an unmarried couple who were homeless and who were alone. The world had no idea that night what was happening in Bethlehem, and only in retrospect do we understand. The same is true of the slaughter of the infants. Herod didn't hate those baby boys. He didn't know enough about them to hate them. He just wanted to kill Jesus. In a real sense, they died so Jesus could live. Years later, Jesus would die so that they could live. The reality is that Jesus was born to die. Herod tried to kill Christmas, but he couldn't. God wouldn't allow it. In closing, I'd like to say a word in favor of Herod. He has come down through history as a symbol for the worst kind of brutality. Yet while we hiss at his name, let's stop for a moment and give him his due. At least he took the birth of Jesus seriously. He believed the Magi when they said they were looking for the one born King of the Jews. Think, think about it this way, Herod knew about Jesus and he tried to kill him. The Magi knew about Jesus and they worshiped him. If information alone could save us, then even Herod would have gone to heaven. But it's not enough to know about Jesus. You must personally respond to that truth by bowing your knee and opening your heart to him. The ultimate question is not how someone else responds, but it's how you respond. That's really the only thing that matters. And so the question is, are you with Herod or are you with the wise men? Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you for this unspeakable gift that you have given to us so that we might be saved from the consequences of our sins. We thank you for the coming of your Son into our world, who lived a perfect life so that he could die in our place on the cross. And all that you ask is that we receive this gift that you have given to us, this gift of eternal life, this gift that frees us from the consequences of our sins. And so we thank you, Father, from the bottom of our hearts and pray that we might not forget this truth as we get caught up in the Christmas holiday, the Christmas holy days, if you will. Give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.